All right, wonderful. Uh, welcome everyone. This is the Sizer seminar, our bi-weekly seminar, and today will be the last seminar for the semester. And I have great pleasure to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Anna Marie Reinhold. She is from uh, Montana State University as an assistant professor there in the School of Computing. And she's also the co-director of the Software Engineering and Cybersecurity Lab at Montana State University. This was a talk that was supposed to be given on March 4th uh, and we scheduled today. And so I'm very happy that uh, Anna Marie could make it today to give this seminar. Uh, Anna Marie is, uh, specializes in the development and application of computational methods to understand the mechanisms underpinning uh, pressing environmental, societal, and cybersecurity problems like what her talk today will demonstrate. Uh, Anna Marie has a BA in biology at the University of Colorado at Boulder uh, and graduating summa cum laude there in 2004. And she earned her master's in biology from Duke University in 2008 and her PhD in ecology from Montana State University in 2014, where she is now. And she spent some postdoctoral work working on interdisciplinary or pan-disciplinary approach to data science. That's one of the interactions we have had. And today she would be talking about communication messages to do them in an effective and timely manner uh, from fishing to floods. And that sounds like a very wide set of topics. And so uh, without any further ado, let me hand over the time to you, Anna Marie, uh, and take it over. Thank you so much for that generous introduction, Asifa. Yes, so as a technical person, I spend a lot of time developing solutions to problems. And I have become really passionate over the last 10 years uh, in looking at risk communication because what I've realized and what many others have realized is that these technical solutions alone aren't enough to motivate protective action. So um, you can think about a seatbelt. A seatbelt in a car is absolutely useless if we can't uh, get people to use it. And so that's what we're going to talk about today uh, in this talk. So. As we get started, it's important to realize that risks and crises occur in cycles. And risks frequently become crises when people do not act to take protective actions. So risk communication is proactive and preventative, whereas crisis communication is reactive, having occurred after a disaster strikes. So the goal of risk communication is to motivate people towards protection mitigation strategies that can either impart resilience so that disasters uh, have a smaller effect or to totally prevent any sort of uh, negative consequences. So our research investigates how we can persuade people to take protective actions by changing how they think about the severity, the likelihood, the importance, and the relevance of a given risk. And so what we call this is risk salience. Now, the situation that we typically have is that our, um, our experts, shown here in blue, have a different perceived salience of a hazard than our target population does. So when it comes to riverine flood risk, as shown here, and also fishing, typically the experts generally appreciate that the likelihood of an event is much higher than the target population does. So what this means is that the experts perceive salience of a hazard for that target population is higher than the target population believes it to be. So what we know is that conventional risk communication does almost nothing to close this gap. But if this gap doesn't get closed when a hazard strikes, then disaster and crisis become imminent. So the question then becomes, how do we close this gap so that we can keep people, our infrastructure, and our supply chains safe? So this was the question we were asking initially in a National Science Foundation uh, study grant that was focused on hazard preparedness in a natural hazards context. 
And so this was my big, uh, this was really the, how I got involved in uh, natural hazards and what we were in, in risk communication. And what we were doing is trying to see if we could improve hazard preparedness using storytelling techniques in risk communication. And yes, you heard that correct, storytelling techniques. Yes, we're gonna talk about storytelling in a cybersecurity talk. So the storytelling technique that we talk about is called narrative risk communication. And this narrative risk communication framework, we've shown in a number of studies um, from this grant alone, we've shown it to be effective. And I'm going to focus on one particular grant or one particular paper entitled Persuasion with Precision and Using Natural Language Processing to Improve Instrument Fidelity for Risk Communication Experimental Treatments. So what does this mean? So what this means is that we're using some computational techniques, natural language processing, to essentially make our messages have higher validity and fewer threats to reliability so that when we create risk communication messages, people are more likely to take protective actions. And this paper and the work that I'm going to talk about here was foundational for developing the DARC domain agnostic risk communication framework that I'm going to introduce later in the talk. So message testing research. So the folks who create messages such as risk and crisis communication messages, what they're aiming to do is they're aiming to maximize the efficacy of those messages. They want to get people to take protective actions to help keep themselves safe and impart resilience in our systems and our communities. And there's an important concept here in message testing research. And that concept is instrument fidelity. So instrument fidelity hinges upon messages representing treatment conditions as precisely and accurately as possible. And this is important because what we do not want to dilute a message or test tangential concepts. So you might ask, well, how are risk communication messages typically created? The standard approach is that folks usually go out and they collect a qualitative source text, such as uh, interviews. They get together in a room and apply expert opinion and some theoretical constructs. And then they communicate these messages to the public in alert systems or surveys or some other um, platform. Now, the problem with this is that these messages are created in a black box. And because of this, there are numerous unmitigated threats to <coughs> instrument fidelity, internal validity, and the, the process simply isn't repeatable or reliable. So essentially what this means is a different set of experts would create a different set of risk communication messages, even giving the same um, underlying source text and hazard information. So, it's important that we surmount these uh, challenges of having a robust um, experimental design and robust message construction because precise messages operationalize intended treatment conditions. Uh, so if we have a poorly created message, we can result in uh, type one errors, which means that we would reject a true null hypothesis if a message tests unintentional or tangential concepts. And we can just as easily result in a type two error, accepting a false null hypothesis if the constructed message dilutes the treatment condition. So how do we know if designing risk communication with one method is more effective than another method? So one way and a well-established way is to ground it in a strong theoretical framework and then to use a strong research design to operationalize it. So the theoretical framework that we use, again, is this science of stories. It's the narrative policy framework. The narrative policy framework assesses the power of stories in decision making. And it's a validated theoretical framework for affecting behavioral change in decision making. Narrative Policy Framework, or NPF, has been around for 20 years, and for 10 years, our group and others have been pointing Narrative Policy Framework towards uh, hazard and, and, decision, and risk decision making. And what's important to know is that the Narrative Policy Framework focuses 
on how information about a risk is communicated. So NPF recognizes that all of us as human beings have what we call priors. These are previous uh, and tightly held values and beliefs. And these priors are filters through which we see the world. And they're filters through which we see scientific information about risk, such as cyber risk. Once we, uh, once we interact with information about risk, Inside of us, inside of our brains, we have effective responses, and these effective responses change. And so our effective responses, the balance of affective response tends to go up when we, um, when we interact with information that resonates with us or that makes us feel positively, and the balance of affect makes us go down uh, when we watch a sad movie or when we receive information that, you know, you can think about going to the doctor's office and you get some information you don't, um, you don't particularly want. Our effective responses can go down. Um, so this is important because our affective responses influence whether or not we will make decisions to prepare when presented with information about hazard and risk. So in sum, the narrative policy framework asserts that human beings respond to story, that our affective responses, our emotional gauge, engagement and how we feel also impacts our decision to, um, to prepare in the face of risk and crisis. So in the, um, in the Persuasion with Precision study, what we did is we varied science information about risk. So there's some literature out there uh, from Lucy Jones and others who stated that um, certainty messages. So if I told you that, uh, that a cybersecurity breach was going to happen, um, in certain terms that you would be more likely to uh, take protective action than if I told you that there's a 10% chance or an X percent chance that a cybersecurity um, breach is going to happen. And so what we did is we varied the scientific frame and more importantly, we varied the characters in the story. So we presented scientific information about uh, flood risk using either victim language where the recipient of the message, we cast our target population as victims or we cast our target population as heroes, the heroes of their own story. And so just two little excerpts from the messages that we created, just so you can get an idea of, of what this would look like. So here's a victim, uh, an excerpt from a victim narrative. You, your friends, and your neighbor could be harmed or wiped out by high post-flood premiums and loss of valuable assets such as cattle and houses. So you can feel the, the balance of affect shift towards the negative there. Whereas, here's a hero, an excerpt from a hero message. Working together with your local emergency responders, you can think about and begin to implement individual and community strategies before a disaster occurs. And so you can feel that affective response and that balance of affect shift towards the positive in that hero message. So again, coming back to this question, how can we create reliable and replicable message, messages that best operationalize these victim and hero characters in science information about risk. So our strategy was to figure out what the victim and hero words were in our source text and to use those words in our risk communication messages. And then in order to ensure that our messages were replicable as well as reliable, we created these narrative science messages with a common template. We used an algorithm essentially. And we did this again so that we could minimize threats to instrument fidelity, internal validity, reliability, and replicability. Okay, so here up above, we have this de facto approach for creating risk communication messages, and then we have our approach, what we call the persuasion with precision procedure. So persuasion with precision is what is known as um, uh, mixed methods, uh, sequential mixed methods procedure. 
And really what you need to know is that what we do is we take the best of qualitative social science research and the best of or most appropriate aspects of quantitative computational science research and we integrate it so that when we create our final messages, they have uh, they, that we can oper best operationalize the theory and reduce threats to validity and reliability. So each step in this procedure is designed to improve how we operationalize uh, these different components of precision. So how did we do this? Well, the first thing we did is we went out and we talked to people. We conducted 42 interviews with people living with flood threats to capture the key terms and the linguistic elements that our target population uses when they're talking about flood risk. We transcribed those interviews and this became the qualitative source text. After transcribing the interviews, we then did human coding to identify the hero and victim language that our target population was using in their own descriptions of their risk of flooding, thereby producing a hero corpora and a victim corpora each containing words that the target population was using to describe their own uh, experiences with flooding. We then use natural language processing and machine learning um, so that what we could do is proceed with automated content analysis to classify our, um, to classify and create this corpus of hero words and victim words. So once we had these victim and these hero words, we then constructed our messages using this common template, this human algorithm. And this is what I mean by that. So here's our algorithm. And every message began with a definition of flooding, the same definition of flooding. And then we uh, framed the problem of flooding using either victim or hero words. We then pro uh, proceeded to provide science information about flood risk using either probability or certainty language. And then we had the uh, target population do something um, and provided directives at the end of these messages using either victim or hero words. So let's take an example. So this is a victim narrative, as you can see indicated by the blue, that used probability language. And after creating the real messages, so we have a few sentences corresponding to each one of these sections. And after creating the real messages, what we did is we asked, well, how well did we do? Now, we used uh, natural language processing and machine learning to score how strongly each word was associated with the victim language and how strongly it was associated with the hero language. And this helped us assess how well our alg algorithm worked and, um, and to assess if there were threats to validity in our resultant messages. So here's a plot of this victim message that I'm showing here uh, using the probability language. And so each dot in this plot refers to a word in the narratives that we constructed in the risk communication messages. The flood definition um, and uh, science information words are shown in black. And then our, um, our character words, our victim words, are shown in, our, our victim and hero words are shown in, um, in red. And so, what you can see is on our x-axis that we've got stronger victim words to the left and stronger hero words to the right. And as this is a victim narrative, you can see that there are more red dots to the left, so there's more victim words um, in this narrative, as you might expect. And we did this for all the narratives that we created to, to assess the um the extent to which we were operationalizing our algorithm and then um we also tested a victim to hero narrative arc where the messages began using victim language and ended using uh, hero language but i have um i've pulled those out from the slide uh for the sake of um space so the points for that are not shown here but we did but we did test those as well Okay, so from there, we went out and we conducted validity and reliability testing. 
So recall that we were comparing conventional risk communication to narrative-based risk communication, and the results of the validity and reliability testing are published in this study here. Uh, but what you can see um, quickly here is that we've got the magnitude of the affective response. So this is the extent to which people are uh, emotionally engaging with these messages. And on the x-axis, we have the various different message types. So we have conventional science um, messaging, and then we've got our victim hero. And then, as I said, these were the other, the victim to hero narrative arcs. What you can see is that the conventional science messages were inferior in terms of um, emotional engagement or the magnitude of affective response as compared with narrative-based risk communication. And so this is one of several results in this paper that indicates that messages created using persuasion with precision have really have high instrument fidelity. Another thing that we can see is we can actually look at how people responded to these messages in real time. So each participant had a, a dial response and they would turn the dial up when they felt um, positively towards the message and then they would turn the dial down uh, when they felt negatively towards the message and we measured their responses in real time. Now recall that everyone was read the same flood definition. So what you can see here is that the dial responses, when people receive information about flooding, um, the dial responses all went up and essentially, or generally went up. And so um, when we talked to people afterwards, this is because they said that this was because the messages resonated with them and their experiences of flooding. And um, and what we see is that, um, so here's the zero line, we see that there's an increase in the valence of affect. So they're feeling more positively towards um, this message segment. When we frame the problem of flooding, it didn't really matter how, how we framed it. We largely saw that people's valence of affect was, um, was pretty flat. However, when we present information, science information, using conventional science language, what we see is the valence of affect goes down. And this was across all treatments. So what's important here is that this section of the messages, we based, uh, we created this section of the messages using the way that conventional information about hazard and risk is, uh, is conveyed. So when we present science information using conventional methods, the affective responses in our target population go down. However, when we give people directives um, and we frame them using character language, we see differential responses. What you can see here is that the when we start out giving people um, information about flood using a victim language, and then we shift to hero language, we see the valence of affect go up. We see high valence of affect um, in our uh, hero language or hero uh, characters in action sections. So when we give people directives, uh, if we cast them as heroes, their valence of affect goes up. And, um, and then we see that it goes down when we, um, when we use victim language. So following our successful validity and reliability testing, we then used our, our narratives in a survey experiment, the results of which are summarized here in um, this fairly recent paper in environmental communication. But what's important here is that we've now got two different studies that have encompassed a large spatial range um, and in this one, we used a survey experiment. In this one, we used in-person dial response technology. And what we've got is strong evidence that our messages have strong instrument fidelity, that our persuasion with precision procedure is repeatable, and that we can see differential responses when we use uh, narrative risk communication. So from here, we set out to expand our risk communication research to improve cybersecurity. And we secured funds to do this work from DHS as part of a broader cybersecurity research project. And the risk communication part of the DHS funded work was uh, to investigate the promise of narrative risk communication for diminishing cyber risk. 
And in particular, we were looking at adopting or adapting the persuasion with precision procedure and the narrative policy framework to cyberspace. So a long story short from this work, our collaboration with the Virginia Modeling and Simulation Center was born, and this research has grown significantly since then. What's important to note is that in doing the literature review for this cyber study, what we found is that there were scholarly advances in the natural hazard risk communications research and in the public health risk communications research that were not being picked up in the cybersecurity risk communications research and vice versa. And so this got us to thinking that we need to start building a domain agnostic risk communication framework that is adopted adaptable across hazard types. But before we invested heavily in this framework, we needed to research whether or not it was really needed. So recall that the purpose of risk communication is to improve health and well-being, to mitigate the deleterious effects of a disaster, and to impart resilience. And the research I'm going to talk about now recognizes that risk and crisis communications research all have this common goal across hazard types. But we continued to ask the question, could it be that advances in risk communication research in one area are not transcending, transcending to other disciplines? So our strategy was to go out and to take stock of the existing publication landscape with respect to risk and crisis communications. To do this, the first thing we needed to do was to identify uh, some publications related to risk and crisis communication. We then wanted to evaluate how the risk and crisis communications field has been changing and growing, and we wanted to see how widely dispersed the publications were. Were they concentrated in um, a few journals or were they spread out? And then we wanted to see the extent to which the literature was siloed. So we wanted to know how the literature was distributed by discipline, such as computer science, political science, or domain, the primary domains being STEM, social science, and humanities. So, in order to identify a corpus of publications related to risk and crisis communication, we went to the Journal of International Crisis and Risk Communication Research, and we scraped every keyword used in every issue matching this string. So basically, if it had the word risk, crisis, hazard, uh, the stem of communication, and the stem of prepare or preparedness, we grabbed those keywords. And then we said, well, we don't want incidental keywords. So it, as, if they're present in at least two publications, we're going to include them in our search string. And so this is the set of keywords. And I recognize this slide is rather horrendous, but the thing to notice here is that you see a whole lot of crisis. You see a whole lot of communication. There's a lot of risk, quite a bit of hazard and um, yeah, and I, I think the word mega crisis even made it in here. So, um, so these were the keywords that we used to then search four different sets of databases for papers on risk and crisis communication research. So again, we used those keywords to search each of these four databases, and we constrained our search from 2002 onward so what we wanted to do is we wanted to capture if there were any effects related to 9-11 in the literature, and, um, and this resulted in 5,264 risk and crisis communications papers. Once we had these um, 5,200 papers in hand, we then collected uh, the metadata from those papers. Now, to evaluate the extent to which the literature was distributed by disciplines, we first needed to develop disciplinary lexicons. And so what you can see here is that we've got our STEM domain, and within STEM, there's a suite of disciplines. Here we've got information science, computer science, engineering, earth science, astronomy, biology, chemistry, physics. Within the social sciences, you can see management, business, and so forth. And then within the humanities, we see history, English language, religious studies, so forth and so on. So these were the 
three primary domains, and each of these were the disciplines within those domains. So, um, so what we did is, again, to evaluate the extent to which the literature was distributed by disciplines, we scraped the Wikipedia pages for every one of these disciplines shown here. And we grabbed all the non HTML text and then we did some basic natural language processing on that text. We calculated term frequency inverse document frequency for every word in each discipline with respect to all the other disciplines. And then we normalized the scores for each word based on the rank in the discipline. And at the end of the day, what's important here is that this allowed us to identify the words that were most important to each of these disciplines shown here on the right. Once we knew the words that were most important to each discipline, we could then calculate what we call the disciplinarity of each paper. We calculated this disciplinarity for each paper by quantifying how words in the metadata of those papers aligned with the different disciplinary lexicons. Once we had that, we then conducted hierarchical clustering on the disciplinarity scores for the paper. And our prediction was that the disciplinarity of the papers in the corpus would adhere to the domains. And so what this means is we were thinking that the humanities papers would all fall out together, whereas the STEM papers would fall out together as and the social science papers would fall out. So um, now for some results. So First, the first results I'll present are on evaluating the rate of growth in the field and looking at this, uh, how widely dispersed these publications were relative to their outlets. So what we have here on the X is the year and on the Y, what we've got is the number of publications shown in blue and the number of outlets shown in gold. And what you can see is that for both, there was a rapid rise in risk and crisis communications um, publications following 9-11, and researcher attention has stayed high since then. Now we have some new research that um, my master's student, Maddie Monroe is doing, and um, she's do doing a, a literature review looking at computational methods and risk and crisis communication research. And what she has seen is that there is yet another spike, as you might predict, following the COVID-19 pandemic. So what this means is that researcher attention is high and there's a lot of folks out there that are studying risk and crisis communication research. However, these publications are really widely dispersed in the literature. So what we have here on the Y axis is the number of publications and on the X axis is we have the number of outlets. So these are journals, conference proceedings, so forth and so on. And this dashed line here is a one to one line. So if every publication was um, in a unique outlet, then we would see um, then we would see the points falling along this line. But that's not what we see. What we see is that they largely fall along this two to one line. And this is true across all the years. And so the points are color coded by year. Um, and so even though we see these different rates of change, the number, the ratio is roughly 2.1 to one uh, in terms of the number of publications per outlet. And this was surprising to me, uh, given that there are a number of specialty journals that focus on risk and crisis communication research, such as um, JRICR, that where we had scraped these keywords. Now, when we wanted to, um, now I'll present the results in, for evaluating the extent to which the literature was distributed by discipline and domain. And so, Here's our clustering results from um, of the disciplinarity scores of the various different risk and crisis papers. And what we can see is that there's some siloing. And the easiest way to see this is, uh, quite honestly, it's to squint. And what you can see is that up here in purple is that our our papers with high with our papers with high um, STEM disciplinarity scores are all separate from our papers down here in green, which are our humanities papers. And so what this is indicating is that we've got almost complete siloing between STEM and humanities. 
And in orange, uh, we have our social sciences. And so social sciences papers were the only ones that um, were distributed throughout this tree. Now, to dive into the results a little bit more closely, what you can see up here on the top is that information science and computer science clustered closely together, as did management and business, as did Earth's, these other closely related disciplines, Earth science and astronomy, chemistry and biology were together, communication and media studies, sociology and anthropology, and then just, you know, another example is religious studies and philosophy. So what this indicates is that we tend to communicate in uh, in these smaller groups rather than across disciplines and domains. Now, there's one other thing I want to point out in this figure. Note that information in computer science are way out here on their own, kind of in the, in an own in their own branch, meaning that computer data and information sciences are using distinct language in our publications, suggesting that our risk and crisis publications are quite siloed from that of our other um, risk and uh, crisis communication scholars. And I think that this has um, important implications as we're talking about cyber risk. So to wrap this section of the talk up, um, we know that risk and crisis communications research is an, is an active area of research. We know that the publications are highly dispersed. We know that unfortunately, they also appear to be siloed. But there's some other work that's important related to this that we found in doing our literature review. So in addition to the siloing, our literature review also illuminated other challenges for effective risk communication including that risk and crisis communication scholars and practitioners continue to be overly reliant on technical directives and procedural approaches. So these are challenges with how we are communicating, but there are also challenges with our target populations. Our target populations are subject to information overload. We are living in a time with rapid and overwhelming media cycles, rampant disinformation, and we know that attention spans are shorter now than they were 20 years ago. In addition, we have structural obstacles such as diminished graph and math literacy that are challenges when you're trying to communicate about risk, and in particular, cyber risk that is inherently technical. In addition, we are also living in a time um, wherein we have a new normal with extreme weather that impacts our critical infrastructure, our supply chains, and we have crises that are highly interwoven. So the risk and crisis communication landscape is changing. We are facing new and magnified challenges. And this was enough for us to make the call for a convergent framework for communicating risk and crisis information. In doing so, our team has grown um, both at Montana State and at uh, the Virginia Modeling and Simulation Center as we continue to do this work. So again, we know that we have these current challenges, but there are also strengths including that there's high researcher attention and interest in risk communication research. There are also strengths in that there are interdisciplinary groups at both the University of Colorado and the Society for Risk Analysis who are focused on trying to create risk communication messages that are highly effective to keep people safe across a wide range of these disasters and hazards because they know like us, that these um, these disasters, we are living in the Anthropocene and things are highly, highly interrelated. Um, disasters of one type quickly lead into disasters of another. In addition, another strength we have is that these tremendous advancements in large language models may make them excellent tools for creating risk and crisis communication messages. So what we have done is we have created the Domain Agnostic Risk Communication Framework. We call this framework Domain Agnostic because it can be applied to any risk from fishing to floods. 
And we are doing risk communication because we are creating messages that are intended to get a target population to take protective actions. So the starting point for using the DARK framework is you have to know who your target population is. These are the people whose behavior you are trying to change. For instance, these could be the people you are trying to prevent from falling for a phishing scam. You also need to know what the protective actions and behavioral directives are, and you need to have a theoretical framework selected. Again, we continue to use the narrative policy framework due to its proven power and worth. The dark framework builds upon persuasion with precision. Persuasion with precision was extremely effective, but it was also really slow and laborious. Persu or the domain agnostic risk communication framework is comprised of three social science steps and three computational science steps. And to use it, what you need to know is what the relevant information and stage is for um, a particular hazard. We need to know the salient filters, risk perception, perceptions, and the linguistic elements of our target population. We need to know how we should frame these messages and write them so that they can align with the theoretical framework so that we can effectively motivate people towards protective action. Now, in terms of computational science steps, we need to use natural language processing and other techniques, machine learning, to identify the words and concepts that are critical for conveying risk to the target population. And also critically important, we need to know which words need to be avoided. We then uh, utilize prompt engineering and large language models to create the messages. And we need to investigate how well these messages operationalize the th theory in the associated textual te key textual elements, like I showed in those um, point histograms that we um, used in Persuasion with Precision. We then need to go out and test these messages to determine how effective they are for protecting motiv um, motivating protective actions. And from here, then we decide whether or not the messages need to be refined or if they're ready for deployment in um, surveys or, or early alert systems. So I've shown you the, um, the uh, sort of a cartoon schematic of the dark framework. But I think that this UML activities diagram helps to illustrate um, to illustrate you, you, how using the dark, um, well, let me step back. It's easier to see the integration between the social and the computational science steps using the UML activities diagram. So what we have here is we start in our social science swim lane and we, um, we have parallel activity flows where we identify that critical hazard information and structured descriptions of the target population. We can then use that information as we operationalize the theoretical framework by either using an existing process to create messages or to use a new process for creating messages wherein we define the LLM prompt content, we construct those messages using prompt engineering, we validate the messages, and then we reach a decision point here, whether or not we want to refine those messages, or if we move towards testing the messages in real time. After testing the messages in real time, we make decisions on whether or not we need to refine or if we're ready to move towards deployment. We currently have an ongoing study where we're building narrative risk communication messages with this domain agnostic risk communication framework across four hazard types including flooding, active shooter, cyber phishing, and cyber insider threats. And our preliminary results are showing that the messages created with the dark framework have high instrument fidelity and are effective, with messages created using the narrative policy framework outperforming straight science messages. Recalling that persuasion with precision was effective but slow, we are enthusiastic about how the dark framework is both effective and significantly faster. And our vision is that messages created with the dark framework can be integrated into early warning and alert systems to motivate protective actions across domains. And so we can target people uh, to move towards protective actions, whether we are targeting um, cyber dashboard watchers or whether I am targeting my parents who um, 
James was talking earlier about they want to click on every survey link. Sorry, mom and dad, I'm throwing you under the bus and recording here. But these are these. This is the extent and the breadth with which we are trying to um, motivate protection and change. So to wrap up, I want to thank my funders, the, the Department of Homeland Security here in the US, as well as the National Science Foundation and acknowledge my collaborators. Thank you very much, Anna Marie. That was a wonderful tour, uh, and I loved how it finally connected uh, the uh, flooding story and into being a domain agnostic. I'm sure uh, some of the audience here will have questions. I'll open up the time for asking questions now. Uh, you can uh, raise your hands or, or unmute yourself and ask. Um, we've got about five minutes left, and so we'll use this time. And James may have a reminder for survey at the end. But let me see if you have any questions for Anna Marie. James's survey is not fishing. <laughs> no, it's not. It is not. Uh, so, so while people may ask questions or maybe think of a question, I could maybe begin asking. One thing that struck me was. Um, like the opposite of this. This is for risk communication. It's extremely important and you can apply it across various areas and you've been meticulous in you know how you build the model so that you have you know published work and things like that to rely on. But if it is about you know, like motivating people, so like you are an activist or something, it's not risk, but you want to you know want to call people for action in a way. Could something like this be used? for positive things too? Oh, absolutely. Um, so the narrative policy framework, there's an extensive body of research that is um, that focuses on uh, doing just that, essentially getting, you know, using um, using the framework to both understand how people cognitive models about risk and about how we um, process information as well as in in terms of affecting decision making across a wide range of areas and so uh you know clem clem you will see clem up here so Clem, Liz, uh, and i we were part of the original team that was looking at uh the at the flooding but it was really this is really liz's um I mean, this is the hallmark of her career. She just was inducted into the National Academy of um, Public Administration for her work on narrative policy framework. And she has done so much excellent work looking across different hazard types and across um, different cognitive models. And she is, um, you know, she's she's really shown um, the power of this in, in decision making um, and all different types of decision making, Asifa. Yeah, all right. That's wonderful too. Uh, so, so to build up on that thing that you did before you build your models, uh, the, the the word selections, the published work, and mm -hmm. things like that. That entirely, I, I can see why that is needed because you want to still talk about knowledge in a in a in some validated way, right? But some of the, especially if it's about risk and how audiences would respond to it, I can imagine or not necessarily published peer reviewed type of work, but all over the internet, there may be ways to that could be relevant. Is there is there anything you you do to that, or do you rely entirely on published work type of uh, corpus that you build? Yeah. So in in that paper, what we were trying to do is we were trying to figure out if disciplinary advances in one area were not transcending another, and we used uh, lexicons as a surrogate. But um, yeah, so people have been scraping tweets and um, blogs and uh, bulletins, and they've been looking at um, and they've been looking at how uh, there's some interesting work on um, misinformation campaigns and and how um, how people are communicating um, information and misinformation people are scraping facebook um so this you know there's a lot of people who are out there looking at um different models for for communication mm -hmm. 
using natural language processing and then trying to fit them to these other to various different theoretical frameworks. And so, you know, we look at narrative policy framework because it's been so effective in um, hazard decision making, but there are numerous other frameworks that are out there um, for communicating risk and so forth. And in fact, the, the way that we created the science messages for the um, for the flood study is um, Clem and one of his students um, and myself, we went and we scraped a bunch of bulletins from um, from the USGS and from FEMA and so forth and so on to try and mm -hmm. figure out uh, how we should construct messages that use similar formats and language as they did. Mm -hmm. All right, thanks. Um, anyone has a uh, maybe last minute question? I know it's well received. Uh, I think this was something that I could sense. The audience <laughs> has followed along a great with great interest. You, you did an excellent job uh, for you know getting us through the, uh, a large body of work you've done, Namari. Uh, so thank you very much. Uh, so for those of you who are the Sizer students, I know many of you are. Uh, fill out the survey so that you know uh, we were here and give feedback on uh, the seminars today. This is our last seminar for the semester. I hope you have the last two weeks of the semester finishing strong. I will see you in the seminar series in the fall, but there is the summer workshop coming um, and there will be several Montana State uh, University um, speakers on the workshop. So thank you very much again, Anna Marie, for an excellent talk today and, and uh, have a great day the rest of you and we'll see you next time. Um, thank you all so much for having me. I'm honored. Wonderful. Thank you.